Thank you, Chairman Cody. Good morning, Chairman, Superintendent Johnson, board members, advisors, and folks who may be listening in. Uh, I am Donna Brown, Director of the Division of Federal Program Monitoring and Support. Uh, I am joined today by Jan Moore, who is the Assistant Director at the National Center for Homeless Education. I'll share a little more about Jan before I hand off the podium to her a little later. Last month, um, as Chairman Cody indicated, I brought to the board an item which was re uh, revisions to the dispute resolution policy for homeless students and their families. And I shared at that time with you that in 2016-17, over 30,000 students and other children had been identified in North Carolina as experiencing homelessness. Today, I'd like to share with you some additional information around the topic of homeless experiences so that hopefully it will give you some additional context and perhaps bring any future conversations that this board would like to engage in with other education stakeholders, policy makers, and I believe uh, even as identified last month, perhaps housing authorities. Since 2010, the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction has managed the homeless education program through a contract with the CERV Center at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And not only has it been a smart thing for us to do from the beginning, but it's a smart thing now because the CERV Center is also home to the National Center for Homeless Education. NCHE is a technical assistance center funded by the U.S. Department of Education to provide technical assistance, support, and resources to folks dealing with homeless issues across the nation. And it has been greatly beneficial to North Carolina to literally have them down the hall from the North Carolina Homeless Education Program as thought partners as we develop policies and procedures that support these families across our state. Today, this is a brief outline of what we'll be sharing. We're going to give you a little more information about the education for homeless children and youth, a little more data. We shared some with you at the last meeting, and we shared a little more as follow-up. I believe that was provided to board members as it related to some of the counts by district in North Carolina. We're going to look at some data in the national context today. And then we're going to talk a little more about family and youth homelessness, who these students are, and then start a discussion about the intersection of housing and education. So the Education for Homeless Children and Youth program is authorized under subtitle 7B of the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act as amended by Title IX Part A of the Every Student Succeeds Act. States receive funding in proportion to their Title I Part A state allocation. They do retain a portion for state administration and state activities, and then the remainder is made available through a competitive grant process. Schools must comply with the requirements of the Education for Homeless Children and Youth, regardless of whether or not they receive funding. One of the biggest compliance pieces initially is that they have to have a local liaison identified. I was um, a local federal program director in a small county in the northwestern part of the state back in 2002. Um, part of my job was submitting data to this department and discovered at that time that we had zero homeless students identified in our county. And I say this to acknowledge that a lot of work has been done at the department with the support of the state board to first and foremost know who these students are. Until we can appropriately and effectively identify these students, we have no way of ensuring that they are able to beat the odds and that we have more success stories in our state for these children. And this is a very timely conversation today because, as you can see, this is a nod to a PBS broadcast series on students who had, in fact, been able to beat the odds. So I think it's great that we're starting this conversation today. So a little more about students experiencing homelessness. And again, in the context of the board's priority for well-rounded education, 
These students tend to have a higher rate of special education needs. They have more mental and physical health issues. They experience, in general, greater uh, school absenteeism, have more challenge with grade retention, and they tend to drop out at higher rates. They also face, face unique challenges and barriers uh, specific to their population, uh, their lack of a fixed nighttime residence, uh, their frequent moves from school to school that result in a challenge in providing them with equal access to school and the supports that they can be provided there for their educational success. The good news is, because everyone wants to know what can we do, that one of the, the greatest impacts on homelessness in general is education. And we know, and research has shown, that we can, in fact, break this cycle of poverty and homelessness through effective education and reducing those barriers to make sure that these kids are quickly enrolled and stay in school. This slide comes from uh, the result of a study conducted by Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago. Uh, they engaged in an initiative called the Voices of Youth Count, and it resulted in some data points that I think are very interesting. I believe they were published back in November of 2017. You have a link to the full one-page of report at the bottom of the slide. Uh, some other interesting information in there, but did want to call your attention to how homeless students fit in with other populations or subpopulations in terms of risk factors for being homeless. So you can see in the middle of the screen that uh, the youth who are in households with annual incomes of less than 24,000, and so in some part we would consider those to be our economically disadvantaged students, have a 162% greater chance of becoming homeless. Over to the right lower part of the screen, following this in terms of highest risk, unmarried parenting youth have a 200% greater chance of experiencing homelessness. If you look in the top left-hand corner, youth with less than a high school diploma or having a GED have a 346% greater chance of experiencing homelessness. <coughs> so everything that this board does to support education of students K-12 makes a difference. And I really wanted, thought it was important to acknowledge that. So, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, sir. So, some of the youth, some of the kids could fall into almost every category. Those aren't distinguished. Uh, for example, an unmarried parent could also be income less than 24000 and not white. Correct. <coughs> Since I've got this, do you mind? Tell me how you, how do you identify the kids? Is this self-identifying? Uh, this particular study used no, I don't that study. I meant, I meant homelessness, the homeless. How did, how did, how are those, you said in your county that you had zero. How did you find, how did you find those, and do they self-identify, and do they agree to be identified as homeless? They are identified um, based on the specific definitions, which will be shared a little bit later, applied to their circumstances. So these local liaisons actually conduct interviews, if you have it, with families, and in some cases, if it's an unaccompanied youth, with the youth themselves, to determine if their circumstances warrant an identification of homelessness. And we do that? A lot of the work that has been done at the department since I was a local director has been earmarked toward providing the tools and resources to those local liaisons that they need to make sure that we are consistently identifying homeless students across the state. Some additional data points in the context of national numbers. Now, the 30,000 plus that I shared with you last month was based on 2016-17 data counts here in our state. 
The data you see on the screen reflects 2015-16 counts because these are the most current official counts at the national level. So I did want to point that out. So you'll see from 2015-16 to the numbers I provided to you for 16-17, there has been an increase up from 26,377 identified at that time. Compared to the national number, so across the nation, we have over 1.3 million children and youth experiencing homelessness. You can see that there are a large number of these students who are identified as having learning disabilities. There's a good number who are also English learners. Of that 26 plus thousand back in 2015-16, Nearly 2,500 of those were unaccompanied youth. These, these were youth trying to enroll in school on their own. And what's really important to note in terms of what their living circumstances are is that 72.1% are doubled up. The majority, as you can see, of the K-12 students identified live in doubled up situations which is shared housing. The families living doubled up are often confined to one room. They're frequently asked to leave without notice. They are often um, fearful that they may do something to discourage their host from allowing them to continue living there. The children often do not have adequate space to study and prepare for school the next day. And as a result, are overall and often not very well prepared to perform in school. And now if um, I can get the technology to work, I always give that as the disclaimer in the front. I'd like to take the board through a guided simulation to have a little better understanding of family and youth homelessness. So you'll have this on your screen, but if you will indulge me and let me guide us through the main screen, because I hate for you to get too far down in the weeds on your own, uh, because I know we have time limits today and I want to make sure that Jan has an opportunity to share her information as well. This simulation was developed by the Urban Ministries of Durham County. And I have to be very careful not to call it a game. Game implies you can win. Simulations often do not result in winning circumstances. And for the people who may be listening on the audio, Urban Ministries of Durham serves over 6,000 people every year, but you never need help, right? So we can prove it or accept the challenge, and I'm going to accept the challenge. try to make it through the month and the first thing we need to do is find a job. <coughs> so I can choose from second shift working in a warehouse, nine dollars an hour. <coughs> I can work as wait staff for two thirteen an hour in tips. I can work as an office temp for $9 an hour. The hours vary, and I'm gonna choose office temp. My monthly pay is based on 40 hours a week, but temp jobs often vary. My monthly pay before taxes is $1,440. My take home pay is about $1,224. That makes my weekly pay $306.
The Affordable Care Act requires you get health insurance. The good news, your child is covered by the state. The bad news, you aren't. Which plan do you want? And if you can see the screen, Ms. Taylor. I can't see the screen. And I can't see if you hear the screen. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the disclaimer. The gold plan is going to cost $329 a month. The silver plan is $268. The bronze plan is $232. Or I can opt out and pay the twelve dollar penalty, Miss Taylor. And this is day two, and I have a thousand dollars in the bank. Want me to make the hard decision? Yes, I'm hurting inside. I'm just. I feel hopeless already. <coughs> Want to opt out? Please, I don't know what to do. I need help. <laughs> when the penalty for not buying insurance is so low compared to the cost of coverage, it's no surprise that low-income workers like you are opting out altogether. rent that was medium range and the ranges provided. If I had slid the toggle back and forth, you would have seen that the farther away I live, the greater the cost of transportation increase. So I chose a mid-range. In general, folks spend an additional 77 cents on transportation for every mile away from their job that they live. Your new apartment is too small for your stuff. Mr. Alcorn, what do you want to do? You can rent a storage unit for $45. You can have a yard sale, or you can ask a friend to store it. And I will tell you, anytime in this simulation, if you are asking a friend, you literally have to log into Facebook and ask them if they're willing to do it. So, yard sale. Got it. You sold a bunch of stuff, but you only made $150. You can see what the balance is your bank account as a result. And we're on day four. <coughs> the local community college is offering an online course in computer science, which could be your ticket to a higher paycheck. But the class costs $200. What do you want to do, Ms. White? Sign up? Or maybe next semester. I'm probably going to wait until next semester. A family friend sent your child a card. Inside is $10. I'll answer this one. It's tough. What do you want to do? Give your child the $10 or keep the $10? I'm a good mother. I'm going to give it to my child. Everyone is pitching in for a lottery pool. What do you want to do? And this one's pretty easy. I don't play. It may seem like a waste of money, but for people like you who have no 401k or savings account, sometimes those lotteries can look like an investment in a better future. Your car's registration is due. You see you have $331 in the bank. It'll cost $250 to get it road legal. What do you want to do, Mr. McDevitt? Pay the money or take your chances? Take your chances. You'll save money in the short term, but you'll have to pay a $100 late fee for waiting. And if you get pulled over, 
you're looking at fifteen hundred dollars to get your car back. Oh, well, we got three hundred thirty-one dollars, right? Correct. Your child's going on a field trip to the Natural History Museum. The trip costs fifteen dollars. Dr. Oxendine, what do you want to do? Pay the money or don't pay? I'd want to pay the money. Um, I'd want to pay the money. Hooray, it's payday. It's day 10 and we now have $622 in the bank. Your child's sneakers are falling apart and it's time to buy new ones. Name brands are important, but they don't come cheap. What do you want to do? I'm going to go to the thrift store. You're doing some filing when you hear full, two full-time employees saying things about you that are hurtful, not to mention untrue. What do you want to do? I want to keep my job and then stay quiet. A little exercise goes a long way, both for keeping you healthy and relieving stress. You need to start a regular fitness regimen. What do you do, Chairman Covey? Join a gym for $75? Uh, no, I ask a friend to be a running. And it makes you go to Facebook and ask them, so we'll just exit that out. <coughs> Your kid has a friend over when you hear the telltale sound of an ice cream truck. They both run over to the truck. What do you want to do? Well, as a parent, I want my child to have as normal a childhood experience as possible. I'm going to buy some ice cream. Your best friend from childhood is getting married, and they want you to be in the wedding. The only problem is it's in another state. What do you do? I just have to say I can't go. This one takes a little long. So I'm just buying some beans and moving on but did want to share that almost 15% of American households have a hard time getting enough to eat at some point during 2012. So remember as we proceed, I have $607 in the bank, but I only have six cans of beans in the pantry. And I'm on day 16. The flu's been going around and it just hit your house. Your child is running a fever and has the, has the chills but you're supposed to be at work. Miss Scott, what would you do? Stay home from work, send them to school sick, or leave them home alone? I, I, I know what I would do. I'd stay home from work. Yeah, I'm cool that's good mm. There goes another day of pay, plus another strike on your record. And you'll see over in the left-hand column, there are job strikes. We just got one. And it's payday. You're sure you weren't speeding, but the cop who gave you a ticket disagrees. What do you want to do, Miss Godwin? Pay it off, $250? Contest it in court. You get the ticket dismissed, but you had to spend the whole day in court and pay a $50 court fee. Mm -hmm. oh. And you got another job strike. Oh. <clears throat> Your child wants to join an after-school sports team which requires a physical and a uniform. What do you do? <coughs> Mr. Griffin, you can say yes. It's going to cost $50 for the physical and the uniform. Or you can say no. I'll say yes. You're working at a retail store helping prepare for a grand opening. As you grab a $25 vase, 
it slips from your hand and shatters and nobody sees. What do you want to do? Well, I'll take this one. It's tough. I've got two strikes against me on the job already. I got $746 in the bank. It's only day 19 getting through the month. I'm going to hide it. What do you want to do? Hello? Make a payment? Hello? Hello? Hang up. <laughs> if you don't make a payment, your car could be repossessed, just like 1.3 million autos that were repossessed in 2012. And remember, I live 25 miles from work. You come out of your house to discover that someone has siphoned the gas from your car and you're already running late for work. Mr. Duncan, are you going to take the bus? Are you going to call in sick? Are you going to ask a friend for a ride? Ask a friend for a ride since you can't find anybody on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and they won't let us do that, so how do we proceed? <laughs> So you're going to be limited to taking the bus or calling in sick for this simulation. Take the bus. It takes three buses and five times longer to get to work than it would driving. And so you lose a couple hours of pay. Your car has been repossessed. Guess you shouldn't have hung up on that creditor. Since you can't get to work, your boss has to let you go. No jobs equals no more paychecks. And I'm going to stop there if we can get the light. And the next slide is going to ask for your reactions, so I'll go ahead and ask for your reactions while we're trying to get the slide deck going. Uh, uh, Donna, I say thank you for sharing this with us. Uh, it's revealing, and I think it ought to be required of everybody, uh, lawmakers, policymakers, uh, IEC students, uh, faculty. I think it brings a human piece into that. Uh, my my follow-up to that is that my wife and I are involved in a lot of benevolent things, uh, community housing coalition, thing called Neighbors in Need, and, and uh, foundation that does some things, some other things we do personal. Uh, and my earlier question about the identification is associated with my reaction here. So so much, I get it. I don't. I never want to take away the pride. And so, you know, you do a lot of things uh, anonymously. You, you, know, you may like it, just because you and, and never know who did it. But often, the this person just doesn't want to be in the system as homeless or have that stigma. And that's a real challenge to, to find uh, uh, through means that are out there uh, and, and still help them maintain the kind of dignity and honesty. I just want to say, as I've traveled the state and spoken to, especially beginning teachers, I have stressed the importance of home visits. Home visits are so eye-opening. It gives you insight to the struggles that a family goes through. And I tell the story of one home visit I did when I went to what looked like a seemingly big house. And when I went through the doors, I saw that there were tarps hung crisscross throughout the house 
there were multiple families living in this home. My child was in the back left-hand corner. Two cots, a hot plate, and a black and white television set. Mother had died. Dad was working in the fields. And this child was alone all the time. And that man's greatest want and need was for his child to have better than he had. So in the simulation where the child can't go on the field trip, I paid for that field trip. When the child didn't have the shoes, I bought the shoes. That's why I need this board, the legislators, to understand teachers are doing so much more. We're providing for families out of our pockets because we love our children and we want them to maintain their dignity. So I appreciate you bringing this to light and shining a greater light on the circumstances our children are going through every day. There's the voiceless demographic of the young children that can't do anything about this and uh, the, the, the cost that is associated with that to the state uh, and to the federal government and to the local communities is astronomical. Uh, I think I've, I've heard $1.4 million between 0 and 18 uh, in, in uh, providing services to uh, those who don't have uh, the means to have even the basic things. I mean, half your slides were, what do you do when the child does X? And uh, it just it breaks my heart to see when <coughs> $50 million comes in, or $75 million comes in from the federal government and, and gets um, diverted to where this is exactly where it can it can have a positive impact, a generational change, uh, to be able to get out of that cycle of poverty where they, 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 they're helpless on being able to uh, do it themselves. Uh, but with, with the right types of support, uh, it, can, it can change over time. It's, it's a very good return on investment when you can go and do the things that teachers are doing and then just what we can do in society. The second thing, the last thing I'll say, the, uh, the slide where you have the numbers up there, where 1.3 million children, I think it was children, were homeless, uh, and 26,000 of those were in North Carolina. That's 20% of them are in North Carolina where we're not 20, we're close to 20% of the population of the United States. So it's disproportionate, it appears, if I'm, if I'm reading that correctly, you please correct me if I'm wrong. I will not correct you. <laughs> Children don't choose homelessness. They are the, um, the byproduct of circumstances. And um, this whole issue is is the work that I do in, in the private sector. And so um, while this might have been a very um, unrealistic experience for some of you, I see this every day in my, in my job. And um, Wake County is one of the most affluent counties in the state. Um, yet 10 minutes from here, over 65% of the children and families live in poverty. Of 80 students that come to an after school program, all who are um, I, I'll categorize them as at risk. And so while they might have a roof over their head, their parents or their guardians or whomever they may be living with at the, <coughs> at the time, um, and that is a very real situation, um, they're right on the brink of homelessness. And so what I would want to bring attention to is while we may have 30,000 that qualify for the topic or the, the designation of homeless, we have many, 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 many more families who have more month than they have money. And if I were Tricia, who is not here today, I would say the role and the work of the whole child committee and the uniting of resources around families and particularly around children who have no voice would be the most important work that we could do as a state and as a board of education. Ms. Brown, let me correct my math. It was wrong. Sorry. <laughs> you were the math person. I was not there going to correct you. My response to this is that it's, it's, 
it has a lot of pertinence and application at the school level. I, I could see this video being shared in high school with high school students. My, really doesn't matter the grade level because all of the factors that we saw are connected, interrelated. So a lot of decision making, um, choices, <coughs> options, um, just lend itself to discussions at the high school level. <coughs> kind of a prevention. Hey, if there are no other reactions, I'm going to um, share the podium now with Jan Moore. As I mentioned earlier, she's the Assistant Director at the National Center for Homeless Education, which is based at the CERB Center at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. She provides technical assistance to staff at school districts and state departments of education and presents at national and state conferences on issues related to educating homeless and highly mobile students. Jan also has a 20 plus year history of advocating for at-risk children and youth, both as a volunteer guardian ad litem for children in foster care and as a surrogate parent for students with special education needs. Ms. Moore. Donna, can we, uh, how can we access that, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, scenario? The link should be active in the presentation. Okay. And if it's not, I can provide a direct link to Dr. Tan, uh, Townsend Smith, and she can provide that. Good morning. Thanks for um, walking in the shoes of the people that I work with every day. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to look at you because we're both going to be a pub. So. Um, so let me just give you kind of the context of family and youth homelessness. Lots of times it is due to economics. Um, just the lack of affordable housing all over the country. There is no place in this country where you can work a 40 hour uh, work week at minimum wage and be able to afford housing. So just start with that in your mind and, um, and work out with all the challenges that you just looked at. Um, lots of times there are disabilities involved. Um, one loss of job, one issue with a medical um, problem can push people right over the edge. Uh, lots of times there's family conflict. We see that especially with our unaccompanied homeless youth, and you saw the high numbers of unaccompanied homeless youth that we have. There, um, I would say a very common scenario with youth is um, there is a split in the family Dad leaves, um, mom has someone else come in because a typical homeless family is a mom and two children. Um, mom has a partner come in and if there are issues with between the partner and an older youth in the house, who's helping to pay the rent? That guy's not gonna go, it's gonna be that youth. And so they get kicked out um, or leave because of the conflict and oftentimes there are drugs involved, um, other issues of abuse involved. And if you think about the split up of the family with a mom and young children, there's often not that network of support that she can depend on. So we're talking about chronic poverty and traumatic stress. And here's the definition that you were looking for to identify students. It's uh, children and youth who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. And that's sort of the overall definition of the law. It does give some specifics like sharing the housing of other persons after somebody has lost their housing, um, living in hotels, motels, <coughs> campgrounds, shelters, um, just about any place that's not designed for a human being to live, and that would be cars and parks and uh, public <coughs> spaces. And then migratory children that are living in any of those homeless situations, and a youth who is not staying with a parent or a guardian who's living in one of those situations. So the McKinney-Vento definition, which is what we work with in education, is broader than probably what some of you have heard of. Um, shelters, 
especially in our rural areas, just aren't there. Or if we do have shelters in the area, lots of them are full. There are many private shelters that have um, age limits on young men. And I have heard even in, um, as low as age 10, if you have a boy in your family, age 10, they cannot stay in a family shelter. Usually it's a little older, but I was down in the eastern part of the state not too long ago and it was 10 and I was appalled. Um, shelters have stay limits, as um, most of you may be aware of. It could be 30 days, 60 days. Um, and Donna mentioned the doubled up arrangements. Those are very difficult on families. You can imagine the stress of um, living in that kind of situation when there's already the stress of having lost your housing and then move in with somebody else with their, all their stuff going on. Um, the Housing and Urban Development, HUD, most of you have heard of, it administers both COC, you probably have heard of, most communities have either their own local COC or there is a balance of state for all the rest of the folks who don't have their own local one. <clears throat> they administer the COC grant and the Emergency Solutions, the ESG grant. And those are to coordinate housing and other services for homeless students. And I will say, um, in answer to your question about being very sensitive to students, I would never, when talking to a homeless student, I would never use the word homeless because there is such a stigma. I would talk about um, living in a temporary situation, living in an unstable situation, uh, being in transition. Uh, I would never use that term homeless. Um, the key elements in those COC funded, which remember those are HUD, funded. Um, we're looking at prevention assistance. Usually that's a one-time financial assistance to be able to avoid eviction. There are emergency shelter, rapid rehousing, which uh, the research has not shown that to be terribly effective for families. There's permanent supportive housing, but that has to be only for um, those who have a disability. And then there are those wraparound services, so case management kind of services. And you probably have picked up that there are definition issues. Uh, education definition under the McKinney-Vento Act is broader than the HUD definition that the COCs use. So um, we understand that there are just a couple of categories that are different, but those are huge. Um, the education definition does include those who have lost their housing and have doubled up, and it also includes children and youth who are living in motels or shelters. So let's look at this data from North Carolina. Donna showed you this earlier. The doubled up percentage in North Carolina is 72%. When you add that to those who are staying in hotels and motels, that's 85% of our students are not covered by HUD programs. So that's huge. Um, that's those students who are being served in school but cannot be served under HUD housing services. So why is this such a big deal? Yes, there is an overlap in the students and the families that we serve. Obviously, um, I'm sure the COCs would love to serve more people, but they are restricted by their funding requirements. And um, interestingly enough, as we're here in North Carolina, in Raleigh, North Carolina, talking about this issue, there is a hearing in Washington, D.C. right now um, with the homeless, let's see, homeless Children and Youth Assistance Program, um, or our act, I'm sorry, um, and they are talking about this very issue of the definition difference. And so, um, I'm hoping that that's going to move forward in a positive way. So some families and children are going to move in and out of HUD eligibility. So because they're doubled up, they're not eligible, but then they might get kicked out of where they're doubled up and they go into a shelter where they would be eligible. And then they come back or they might go into a hotel and pay for that for just a short period of time because um, lots of our families can't get stable housing because they don't have first and last month's rent and they can't pay the utility deposit. 
they might be able to pay um, the actual rent, but getting into a situation that is fixed is just an impossibility because they can't save up enough money to actually get their foot in the door. Um, obviously, we want our educators at the table when decisions are made because we need input on things like, okay, HUD, if you're, or a COC, if you're going to place a family in a more permanent situation, could we have some input on where that is so it would be near the child's school of origin? Because the child has the right to remain in the school of origin if that, that's in their best interest. And it certainly would be um, a, a leg up if we could be able to do that. So um, we want to make sure that we are there at the table and that we are listening to children and youth and families so that um, they can share their voice too. Just a little bit of um, information on COC programs. They have to establish a coordinated entry process, which is basically a one-stop shopping. Um, instead of sending families to every single program they might be eligible for and having to fill out multiple forms and re-traumatizing them because they have to keep repeating their story of losing their housing over and over and over again. Um, so this has been a really good thing. It's uh, a way to navigate that maze of services. Um, so the time for partnership, I believe, is now, and not just in North Carolina, but all over the country. There are lots of really good things going on. Um, McKinney Vento requires collaboration, and Donna mentioned that local liaison for homeless education who's at every school district. They're required to refer folks out to community organizations. Um, and the COC also is required to include schools, and it's usually the local liaison, in their planning and their implementation. So um, we already have legislation that, um, that puts us together. And at the national level, there is uh, Voices of Youth Count, which Donna showed you those numbers. <clears throat> Excuse me. YHDP is Youth Homelessness Demonstration Project, which we are very involved in. We're providing the technical assistance. There are currently 10 sites <coughs> across the country, and um, we are working with them. This is a HUD initiative but they have required that education come in and be part of this, so we're working very closely with them. There's another round of 10 more sites who are in the process of being funded, and I'm almost positive that there's going to be a third round. So um, at the national level, we see the value in working together and trying to figure out um, how we do this together to serve kids. Uh, we need each other. Schools can't provide everything, and we don't, we, we don't pretend to say that we can. That's not our jobs as educators, but we need to have places to refer families when they need those other services. So um, do, there's lots of research about the importance of kids being stable in school, uh, finishing up school, not dropping out, but we've, we've got to engage them, and to engage them in school, they have to be stable in a school. So this is really our opportunity to change the course. Uh, again, just looking at some of the research on school engagement, school stability, and um, how important it is. I can't tell you how many youth that I have talked to who have graduated um, get scholarships because these kids are bright and they're motivated and it is uh, amazing how often they say, I want to give back. I don't want to have anybody else experience what I experienced. They're going into education and social work and um, law, uh, attorneys. They're doing all kinds of things to be able to give back because they see the value in that. And so obviously educational uh, supports can change the future of our children's lives. Um, school clearly is right in the middle. That's where the kids are. 
So it makes sense that we would be in the middle of any kind of a um, situation. Everybody agrees that housing and education should work together. Um, we're certainly not where we need to be to make that happen, but there are some really positive structural pieces that can guide that work. Um, most of it is just at the beginning, like the YHDP work, but I, I feel good about the direction it's going. I think it gives us um, some promise. There are all kinds of challenges um, that we need to overcome, but again, I mentioned that hearing this morning with the Homeless Children and Youth Act, <coughs> people are sitting down at the table to talk about working together. And I'm just very encouraged that you guys are interested in this because uh, when we talk about chronic absenteeism, this will be huge. If we serve homeless students like we should, think of where your chronic absenteeism rates would be um, if we got them in class as they should be every day. So um, definitely some challenges to overcome, but I'm really hopeful about where we're going in the future. So I wanted to leave just a few minutes in case you guys have questions for me or for Donna. Yes, Mr. Donna. Thank you. Um, I think you asked at the end of the presentation how you felt towards that effect. And the only word that comes to mind is heart wrenching. Mm -hmm. And it is heart wrenching the circumstances that so many of our children in our schools are in and find themselves in um, are so, so difficult. And yet we have them facing very high accountability standards and they have very difficult accountability standards at home. The numbers I think are interesting because, as Greg pointed out, it's 2% seems to be. North Carolina, as I do a quick computation of the number of citizens in the country, I think North Carolina represents maybe 3% roughly of the citizens in the nation. And yet, if you looked at our numbers, it's a rise from 26 to over 30 in the two-year period. So it's rising at about 8% a year, which to Wayne's point, I think there is underreporting issues that still exist. And that's probably illustrated by the difficulty of what the reporting uh, accountability measures are. So I think it's a rising problem. And I think if you compare it to legal aid funding, where nationally, if it goes down, North Carolina still stays the same. The good news is North Carolina stays the same. The bad news is that's because we have so many more people who qualify. So this is a problem that's exacerbating and accelerating in our state and not going in the other direction. Philosophically, um, and I, I think there's a real tension point that um, if we think deeply about this, a lot of our citizens blame the parents and are unable in their adult assessment to separate out that the children don't have anything to do with the circumstances they find themselves in other than that they have parents who are there. And that also doesn't mean the parents don't care in many instances. In many instances, they care very deeply. And so how we find ourselves to negotiate that issue, which is an adult issue that we all struggle with, I think, a lot, or a lot of citizens struggle with, how we, how we deal with that and realize our children are innocent here and we need to find ways to support them. Lastly, I'm interested in thoughts on this, but my comment would be, I think we're part of the problem. Um, if you look at the employees of the state, all the educational employees, <coughs> There are not an insignificant percentage of them who are parents. A lot of them are parents. And there's also not an insignificant percentage of them who do not make uh, the type of living wage you suggested that would be necessary in order to afford housing. If you look at the salaries for a number of our classified employees, they do not reach that level. And so because we're not in a place to appropriately uh, pay a living wage for our employees throughout the state, to our parents of children in our schools, we are a part of the problem. Then we should recognize that, acknowledge it, and decide what we're going to try to do about it. I want to go back to, to the story of uh, the child, and I want to say to Amy, you're so right. It is a whole school, whole community um, effort to change and uh, to break the cycle of poverty and homelessness and I, wanted, I want you to know that my community rallied around that family. 
um, we were able to get new housing. We were able to put him in, in touch with resources through our social worker and our counselor, which we had on site back then full time. Um, again, the importance of having those, those support systems in place at our schools. But um, also, you know, our staff rallied. And, you know, on days that it rained, he came to my classroom. He couldn't read, he couldn't write. The dad um, was illiterate, not only in English, but in his native language. So the ESL teacher and I taught him to read that year and how to sign his name other than just an X, we helped him get on a path to be more successful. And we realized that there were parents just like him. So we opened up um, a literacy, a parent literacy um, time where we were teaching our parents how to read and write. And we opened up our, our computer labs to help them create resumes because they didn't know how to do that. There are so many things that, that are done through the schools to help better the families and to help them, you know, plug in and to have a better life. And I just want everyone to know we need the funding to be able to continue those efforts, to be able to really make a difference in the lives of not just the children, but their families, because their families are the ones that have the circumstances that are causing our children to live the lives that they lead. So, you know, just please continue to shine the light on it. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Davis. I'm not sure who to direct this question to, but um, was there anything in our state's most recent budget that addresses this issue or helps to deal with this issue? Does anyone know if there was anything? Perhaps the city would know. Yeah. Sure. So I'm I'm not aware that there is anything. Um, I'm aware that we're um, we're providing substantial budget cuts at a time when our children are really hurting. And Mr. Duncan's point, we're not <coughs> really as much, so we're part of the problem. Um, I, I think we're a big part of the problem, um, and, and at the very least, we're not part of the solution. I mean, it's, it's historically been a point of pride in North Carolina that we take care of each other. And I think to a large degree, we've lost a significant bit of that in realizing the importance and value of every North Carolinian, regardless of whether you have a residence or not. And I think it's incumbent upon us to speak up for these children, frankly, their parents. Um, and challenge our government that we are all a part of to take on that responsibility that we've historically taken to, and we've all benefited from it to some degree. I know my family has. We're, we're a bunch of mill people who got out of that kind of life largely because of the support of public schools and public university system and a series of other supports that helped us get out. And, uh, I think we, we need to speak up and challenge our funders to invest in North Carolina, especially this talent that is hurting so much now. Okay, we need to wrap this up in a bit, but uh, I hate to see your hand, Dr. Oxenheim, and uh, Mr. Willis. Go ahead. I apologize for being late, but I had reviewed these slides, and you know this is obviously something that you know, we care deeply about, and I hope that people feel the passion around that whole child model being one of the ways that we can begin to solve that problem. But you know, in, in terms of Mr. Davis's question about the budget, you know, and I, this probably already came up, and I apologize if it has, but. I don't really apologize because I think it's worth saying again. You know, when I looked at what happened to the early childhood funding being supplanted, basically, that is just a, a total um, obvious and, and demonstrated lack of understanding what these young children need. 
and we know, and, and Mr. Alcorn, I hope that you will give us more information about the wonderful project that you're doing that is now growing across the state with APSE. You know, that, that is a solution. But, you know, when we have a solution at hand, we have increased federal funding for early childhood, and our state leaders supplant the state funding that was already a part of the promise from last year's budget. You know, I just have a very hard time understanding that. Um, I have a hard time understanding why we don't put more counselors and social workers and nurses in school. The, this population of children has a lot of needs beyond just a safe place to sleep. They have that need first and foremost, but there are myriad of other needs that can be at least partially met if we would put the right people in schools. I appreciate Mr. Duncan talking about the livable wage. You know, I look at this county where I live, this one, we're very prosperous, we've done very well, and now through the housing demand, we're gentrifying neighborhoods and, and running people out who can't afford to stay where they have lived maybe for more, multiple generations. You know, we have a lot of problems, and, and you're right, Mr. Duncan, they're adult problems. And we have to have the wherewithal to, to solve them. And I think I, I appreciate that we've been a state like Mr. Davis. I benefited from so many of the services provided by North Carolina. And how can how can I look at young children and deny them those opportunities? I just I don't understand how people do that. Dr. Oxenine. Just a quick question about the data frame. Um, do you, the 26,000 26, um, kids in North Carolina who are homeless, does, do you think that has, to what extent did, impact, did Matthew impact that number? <coughs> Donald, that would be a question to you. But I think you said 800% increase in Robinson. Generally, when we experience natural disasters, we will see, specific to those communities, the numbers rise. Mm -hmm. So I don't know specifically about Matthew. I could go back and pull I just, some information. That's just a question. I'm just wondering the impact of Matthew on that 26,000. It may not have had any impact. We'd have to look at the numbers of <laughs> longitude. Part. Just curious. That's it. I'm not sure what impact that storm had, but we do see a rise every year. So even if that storm had an impact, I mean, we went from 26,000 last, or 15, 16, to 30,000, um, 16, 17. So the numbers are still rising. Mm -hmm. 